Wait, Hank, hello? Hello? What? I, I, stopped, I thought I stopped that. Man, hey. Hi, yeah, this, yeah, this is Pastor John. Look, hey, I can't, um, no, I already have solar. No, no, serious. Car insurance? You sell car insurance too? What? No, no, hey, hey man, I'm in the middle of no, cleaning service. No, my wife doesn't need a clean. No, I don't, no, I don't have a Christmas gift for her. You do that too? You get me a Christmas gift? Hey, look, I'm in the middle of something. Can I call you in about 40 minutes? Okay, okay, good. Sorry. Sorry about that. That was a, a distraction. And today we're talking about distractions. You see how I did that? Pretty creative, huh? That was pretty <laughs> clever. Kind of worked that out there. Uh, yeah, almost, uh, that was the second. Dis- you know, life is full of distractions. Can you say that with me? Life is full of distractions, right? Christmas. Christmas is full of distractions, isn't it? I mean, Santa, Rudolph, Frosty. Hey, do you know what they call Frosty in Palm Springs? A puddle. Yes, that's, that's what they call him in Palm Springs, right? Life can be full of distractions, can't it? Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Now, I'm not the guy, and those of you that have tried connecting with me on Facebook know this is true. I'm not the guy that can spend hours on Facebook, right? I just... I gave up Facebook so long ago, I just, it was just, it was like a cancer eating up my entire life. So I got rid of, can- I got rid of Facebook, I barely look at Instagram, um, but I, I, have to, I have a confession to you, I'm a YouTube junkie. I mean, I'm a YouTube junkie. I've just, I've just traded one addiction for another, but, but I mean, I can stream 10 videos like this on YouTube. I mean, they just... And, this, and, they, and Google is so nice about it. Oh, you like that one? How about this one? Oh, yeah. I want to see that one. Oh, man, this one. And now I've got three on the sidebar that I really want to see, so I'm opening them in separate windows so I can get back to them after I finish the first one. And I never get back to them, right? I mean, I, I subscribe to a guy called Cool World's Video. As, this guy is awesome, man. He does these videos on astronomy and chemistry, physics, and he talks about quantum mechanics, and he talks about, you know, are there aliens out there and all the reasons, are, and I'm geeking out on you. I know, I know, but I, 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 go, I can just go one after the other on this guy for an hour and a half, and then I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, look where I am. I love watching uh, uh, this guy, Michio Kaku. I don't know if you've seen him. He's a Japanese uh, physicist. He's just he's so engaging. And, 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 you know, he talks about atoms. You know, I, and you've got to learn this stuff, man. Those algorithms don't have a hard time with you. No, they don't have a hard time with me at all, you know. But you've got to learn about atoms. You can't trust atoms. You know why? They make up everything. Oh, PT, stop it. Oh, another distraction. You see how I did that? Pretty clever, huh? Look, the point is, like this sermon, life can be full of distractions. And, and you know, we're like, I saw a t-shirt one time that says, I have ADD, and it's really, oh, look, there's a chicken. You know, and that's kind of my life. That's my life. And then I've got, I've got one person who understands me. It's Christmas. How many of you have put up your tree? You put up your tree? Did all your Christmas lights work? Yeah? Yeah? Did anybody have spent an hour looking for the one Christmas bulb? Yes, thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. My wife says, look, just take the the lights off and put a new string on. No, I'm going to find it. Right? This is... Right? It's like, come on, I'm a man. You don't just leave a strand with one burned out bulb, right? (laughs) That's true. That's what I need. Somebody needs to design real Christmas lights. Anyway, we're continuing this morning in our Christmas series called Travel Light. And we're looking at some of the things that tend to clutter up our lives so that we can lighten the load. And today we're talking about letting go of distractions to attract is to draw together. To distract is to draw apart, to separate, to split your mind into different directions. And that's what happens in our life. Do you find that it's a fight to focus? You find that it's a fight to focus? Say that, fight to focus. 
fight to focus. Because I'll tell you what, the fight is worth it. The fight is worth it. Your life is too valuable. Your calling from God is too great. Your gut is too good to waste your life being distracted by things that do not matter. And that's what happens to our lives. We're looking at the story of Zechariah, the priest, the, the, the husband of Elizabeth, who's the cousin, <coughs> who's the cousin of Mary, who is the mother of Jesus. Open your Bibles this morning, or Bible apps, to Luke chapter 1. And there's a note-taking outline. You were handed it when you came in. It looks like this on the outside, and the outline's on the inside. And on the back, the action plan that just encourage you during the week to read those questions, meditate on them, work through them during the week so that this lesson is not a, a 30-minute shot in the arm on Sunday morning, but, it, but it's a time-released capsule that you work out throughout the whole week, and, and it begins to integrate into your real life, all right? So let's go ahead and stand. We're going to read God's Word together this morning. We're looking at Luke chapter 1, verses 8 through 13, and we'll be reading in the New Living Translation. It's on the screen behind me. Read it together. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple, for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priests, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right of the incense altar. And Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son, and you are to name him John. Let's pray and see what God wants to teach us today. Father, take your word that you've preserved for us these last 2,000 years. So many people have tried to destroy your word. They've tried to burn the book. They've tried to, they've tried to destroy your priests. They've tried to make this go away. But you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, have preserved it for us so that we have a personal relationship with you through the pages of this book. Lord, I just pray today you would meet with us and help us to understand you better today. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Go and have a seat. Zechariah was a priest. He was a servant of God all of his life, but this day, this day is different. This day is different, right? His name has been drawn by lot to offer incense on the altar that stands before the large curtain separating the holy place where the priest ministered and the holy of holies, that small Square is the Holy of Holies. Only one person ever entered into that room. It was the high priest. And he only entered in there once a year. Between the Holy of Holies and the holy place was this thick curtain made of like seven, uh, seven fabrics all together. It was heavy. It was tall. It, it was thick. That's the curtain that was torn in two. Jesus was crucified, creating an opening between the holy place and the holy of holies. Zechariah was not the high priest. He didn't get to go into the holy place. He just went to those steps leading up to the holy, place, the holy of holies. And there was an altar of incense. And one a priest's lifetime, if he was lucky, he would be selected by lot while his order of priests were on duty to go in and burn the incense on that altar. He would choose two of his closest friends and relatives to assist him. The first would go in and clear out the old ashes uh, and make room for the new. Uh, that was his job. He would then worship before the curtain and he would withdraw. The second would have brought coals from Outside the temple area, there was a big altar where the, altar, the burnt offering sacrifices were made. And he would take coals from the altar of burnt offering and bring it into the holy place. And there on the altar of incense, he would place the, the hot coals 
And at the proper moment, while all the other priests and everybody else were outside the temple, basically on their faces, praying and offering up their prayers to God for the redemption of Israel, at that moment, the signal would be given and Zechariah would spread the incense on the burning coals. And as the smoke from the incense would rise up that amazing curtain with gold leaf woven into it that that represented the entrance into heaven as the incense rose up that curtain as, as symbolically representing the prayers of God's people rising up to heaven. Zechariah would offer his own prayer there before this holiest place in all of Judaism would offer his prayer for the redemption of Israel. Meanwhile, all the people would be waiting outside. And as Zechariah would finish, he should then turn and and actually back out of that holy place and then turn and face the people and offer a benediction. That's what he should have done. But as we read, Zechariah gets distracted, doesn't he? At the moment of this tremendous honor he's been waiting a lifetime to experience, Zechariah is interrupted. He is startled by a presence to the right of the altar. He looks and sees what can only be an angelic being. Who else could be there at this moment in time? He looks and sees uh, this angel standing there, and just as suddenly the angel speaks, words that will forever change Zechariah's life. Zechariah's wife has been unable to have children, a trauma that they have grieved over and prayed over all of their long lives, and now they are well beyond childbearing years. But on this this day, the angel tells him their wait is over, that God is answering both prayers, the prayer for the redemption of Israel and their prayers for a son. And what they discover is that God's God's answer, both of those prayers have been woven together. And the answer to both prayers is a child. God's redemption is at hand. And Zechariah and Elizabeth get to be a part of what God is doing to redeem the world. Their prayer for the child and the nation's prayer for redemption is is one and the same prayer. God's redemption is at hand. They will have a son. They're to name him John. He's not just going to be any son. This miracle baby will be like Elijah, the greatest in Jewish history. He's going to turn the nations back to God. And not just Israel, but all the nations will be turned back to God. He will prepare the way for the coming of the one, the Savior, the Redeemer, the Christ of Christmas. Zechariah and Elizabeth have prayed for a son. They prayed for redemption of Israel. They never imagined those prayers were connected. We are often surprised when we are seeking after God, when we are following God with our whole heart and we are praying his will for our lives, not just the things that we want, but the things that God wants in this world. When we are praying for those things, we often discover that our prayers are bigger than we know. We think they're this, but they're this. When Zechariah went into the temple that day, he had an agenda. He knew what he was supposed to do. I mean, this was such an important event in a priest's life, and many priests never got to accept it. He had played this out in his mind a million times, laying on his bed as he fell asleep. He imagined, oh, if I could could be the one to light the incense, here's how I would do it. Here's what I would pray. Here's where I would go. Here's what I would wear. Here's what I would say. Here's who I would bring. He had his agenda all mapped out. He knew what he was supposed to do in detail, but he got distracted. God had other plans. That happens in your life. 
You get distracted by some things to draw you away from God, but you get distracted by other things because God wants to draw you to him. And it is very important for us to know the difference. The scripture that Tinas read earlier between Mary and Martha. Martha thought that Mary was the one that got distracted, but Jesus revealed, no, Martha, it's you that got distracted. Sometimes, sometimes we're distracted by the wrong things. Sometimes we're distracted by God. We say life, ha- life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. This morning, sometimes the distraction is the main event. Keep your eyes open, not to what's happening, but to what God is doing. This is a great story. It's a great story, but what does it have to say to you and I today? Well, you're right in the middle of the busiest time of your life, probably. Christmas is usually the busiest time of the year. Uh, With all that you must do for the big day, it's easy for you to get distracted. And some of those distractions are God calling you to remember him. Some of those distractions are the devil getting your eyes off of the real meaning of Christmas. See, the devil doesn't need to destroy you. He he would like to, but he doesn't need to. He only needs to distract you. Even good things. This morning, let's look at what distracts you so you don't miss God's appointment with your own destiny. So this Christmas, don't get distracted by the busyness, by the busyness. The Apostle John, he wrote this. He said, now the birth of, no, it did it? I don't know where I am. The Apostle John said this, but you belong to God, my dear children, You have already won a victory over these people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Let me say that again. The spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit that lives in this world. These people all belong to the world, right? From the world's viewpoint, and the world listens to them. But the spirit who lives in you has overcome the world. See, the devil doesn't have the power to destroy you. He would like to, but he can't. So he distracts you. And if he can distract you, he can get your eye off the ball. He can make sure that the distractions, the decorations, and all of that stuff gets to all of the attention and focus this Christmas. Zechariah was busy doing the job, always dreamt of doing. And while that might have seemed like the most important thing in the world to him, and it did, it wasn't the most important thing to God. Be clear. Be clear what you're doing at every moment of your life. Don't do anything on autopilot. Focus. Walk in the Spirit. Walk with Jesus every moment of the day. The reality was that the holy place, in all, holiest place in all of Israel at that time, the Holy of Holies, that small box we saw earlier, was nothing more than an empty room. It was supposed to house the golden <coughs> Ark of the Covenant. A golden chest with two gold angels on top representing the mercy seat, the place where God met. And in the box was supposed to be the covenant, the stone tablets that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. The agreement that God had made with the human race. The agreement that every person failed to keep. But there above the covenant... Between the angels was the place of mercy where God would meet. That's what was supposed to be in the Holy of Holies. It represented the very presence of God. But the Ark of the Covenant had been lost centuries earlier when Israel was overrun by the Babylonians. 
And the Ark of the Covenant was either hidden or taken or destroyed. No one knew. All they knew wasn't in the room. All of this pomp and circus, all that Zechariah's hopes and dreams for his entire life, culminating in this moment where he is offering the prayers of the people before the very presence of God, and the room is empty. Our lives are full of empty rooms. Places where God used to be. Places where God used to have an influence in our lives. But something happened. Got misplaced. Got taken. Got destroyed. And now we go through the motions. We go through the, 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 the ceremonies. We, we do all of this stuff. People say, I don't have to go to church to meet with God. Let me tell you something. You cannot, you cannot meet with God like we did earlier today without being in church. You just can't. You can watch all the YouTube videos you want. You can listen to the best preachers in the world. You can't listen to me. And I don't know if that's good or bad. That might be a distraction, but it's a true statement. <laughs> Our lives can be full of empty rooms. Don't worship before an empty room. Fill the room. Make sure God is a part of everything that you're doing. We get one pass through this life. We need to ruthlessly eliminate all of the things that don't matter to make room for the things that do. Can I say that again? We need to ruthlessly eliminate all the things that don't matter to make room for the things that do. Jesus is the reason for the season. Jesus is the reason for life. Jesus is the reason for everything. If Jesus is not a part of everything in your life, stop it. You don't need it. It's a distraction. Now, you don't need to abandon your Christmas traditions, or your other traditions. Just make sure the real meaning is attached to them. Right? Just make sure the real meaning is attached to them. The burning of the incense in the temple was a great reminder of the love that God has for the prayers of his people. But as much as priests like Zechariah made such a big deal out of that honor of burning the incense in the temple, the real big deal was what was happening outside the temple with the people on their faces offering real prayers up to God. The incense, that was just a symbol. It was the real prayers that mattered to God. And the priests made the big deal out of the incense. We do that in our lives. Don't. Look for those areas of your life and ruthlessly eliminate them from your life. Make sure your Christmas includes people who really need your help, like our adopted families, like our Operation Christmas Child. Sylvia and I love to purchase a goat or chickens. There's just something about a boy buying a goat for somebody in some you know, third world country you know, so that they can have milk, milk that I wouldn't drink if my life depended on it, probably. But they like it, and they get a goat, and I'm going to give them a goat. Or chickens, right? Or whatever. Like, I, I, like, you know, our neighbor across the street, they have chickens, but they, but they lay brown eggs and sometimes square eggs. And my wife looks at them and says, I don't know if that's a real egg or not. You know, we'll, we'll just go, we'll go get the ones that's smart and final, right? Uh, but, but, you know, those people, they want square brown eggs. That's okay. I'll buy them a chicken, you know? Uh, it's like, we, we get so, I don't know. <coughs> I can't even talk. But you know what I'm talking about right? 
Give to the rescue mission or the food pantry. You know, go and help out at the food pantry during the holiday seasons. Read to your children, you know, about Santa, but also about Jesus. In fact, don't even read to them about Santa. They're going to hear about Santa everywhere else. Make sure they hear about Jesus from you, not just in Sunday school, but in your home, right? Amen. Thank you for that. Throw a bu- this is hard for me, right? I can't even talk. It's like right there. <laughs> anyway, um, they're throw a birthday party for Jesus. Throw a birthday party for Jesus. Our kids in our, in our choir, don't tell them. Uh, they're going to go to a birthday party for Jesus right after service in the back. They don't know it, but they're going to have some fun. And, and we're going to blow out candles because Jesus is 2,000 years old. It's going to be a lot of candles. <laughs> but, but we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Make sure the fire's on speed dial. Um, there are other distractions uh, besides busyness, Right? There's the distraction of fear. We get distracted by the things we're afraid of. There are a couple of things that would have distracted Zechariah that day. Couple things. The first was fear he'd mess up his assigned task. Once in a lifetime, you get to do this. What if you trip going up the stairs? You know? What, what if you what if you spill the incense? What, what if what if what if you you put the incense on, on the on the coals and it puts the fire out and you have to go outside and go? Anybody got a lighter? You know, I mean, what, what happens? I mean, the, all these things, he had to have been terrified. I would have been, right? You know, if you, you might mess it up. But then the second distraction happened, right? He's interrupted by a sudden presence of the angel. Well, Zechariah was, was there in the temple. The angel <coughs> of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right hand of the incense altar. And Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear, shaken and overwhelmed with fear. I'm sure you, real, you, you resonate with those words, shaken and overwhelmed with fear, right? You sit in the doctor's office and he tells you something, you, you know, you, know you, go, you go in, you go in for a routine, it's my annual physical, I go in for my annual physical and, 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 the, doctor says, and the doctor says something I wasn't expecting, right? And you are shaken and overwhelmed with fear. Your boss calls you in. You've just done a really good job on the project. You go in on a Friday afternoon. You think he's going to give you a bonus, and he gives you a pink slip, and you're shaken and overwhelmed with fear, right? We, we, we know what that means. We know what that feels like. That's what Zechariah's feeling. We want to burn a portion of the Christmas dinner. Uh, what, what if Aunt Susie doesn't like the sweater you bought her, Right? What if there's a family argument at Christmas dinner? Boy, that's never happened in my house, right? <laughs> right? What if that's again? Oh, my goodness. Let me just sit there and not say anything. I don't know. What do you do? What, what if I'm all alone at Christmas time? All these fears distract you. Notice the first words of the angel Gabriel who spoke to, to Zechariah. He says, the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. Do you realize that every time angels show up, that's kind of like their opening line? Not, hi, I'm Gabriel. It's like, don't be afraid, right? Because people are, people are catatonic in fear, right? Uh, God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth is going to give birth to a son. She's going to name him John. Uh, you're going to have great joy and gladness. Many are going to rejoice at his birth. Now it's all the good stuff. Right? He'll be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic beverages. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. He'll turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He'll be a man with the spirit and the power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. He'll cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. We could use a John the Baptist today, amen? <laughs> the message of the angel had for Zechariah is really good news. It's really good news. The one thing he'd always prayed for was going to be answered, and not just answered, but answered on steroids, man. I mean, this is like, this is not the son. He was praying, you know, I just want him to be healthy. No, this guy's going to be, blow the doors off the world. The message of Jesus is called good news. Because your future is absolutely secure. There's nothing, nothing that can change it, even if you burn Christmas dinner. Remember the words of the angels to the shepherds, same thing, right? Fear not, for I bring you good news of great joy. It will be for all the people. 
For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. <coughs> Who's who? <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> yes. That's the message of Christmas, but sometimes it can be overshadowed by the third distraction, tradition. Tradition it can be such a distraction. Zechariah knew how babies were born. He knew there was an age limit to them. As a grandparent, I understand there's an age limit to them. You're supposed to have babies when you're in your 20s. Because by the time you're in your 60s, What? <laughs> Man, it's like, it's like after four hours, I'm ready for a nap. Maybe that's the same way in your 20s, I don't know. But when you're in your 60s, you can take the nap, right? Supposedly. It's exhausting. Zechariah knew all this. He's like, yeah, no, please, God, no, right? I mean, I don't know what he was thinking, but, but here's the thing, man. Yeah? Sometimes our knowledge how things are can distract us from how things can be. Right? Don't don't be distracted by how things are. Put your faith in how things can be. Gabriel's pronouncement was that God was answering the prayers of Zechariah and, and Zechariah and Elizabeth. It tells me they're still praying the prayer. Now, they, now uh, they're still praying the prayer. I had a friend, Fred Jones. He was one of our full, first elders here at Life Spring. And, and he, uh, he was, I knew him from the church in Camarillo. And on his 60th birthday? On his 60th birthday, he found out his wife was pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you think you had it tough, right? <laughs> right? 60th birthday. My wife is pregnant. No. We need a second opinion, right? <laughs> right? Right? She just, turned, she just turned 25, something like that. I think she just turned 25. She survived. More, better than that, Fred survived, right? Sometimes our knowledge of how things are can distract us from what God says they can be. Don't, don't let it happen. <laughs> I'm not saying anything funny. I don't know what she's going on about, but that's okay. This is, this is good stuff, guys. <laughs> Zechariah said to the angel, uh, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. Be careful what you ask for, okay? You want a sign, Zechariah? Here's a sign. You're not going to be able to speak until the baby's born. How's that for a sign? That's your sign, which is going to be kind of a bummer because you're supposed to go out right now and pronounce a benediction, and that's going to be tough to do when you can't talk. <laughs> and and it, says, it says that the people sensed that something happened in the temple. Yes, something happened in the temple, and he can't even tell them. What have been praying for that God has yet to answer? Don't get distracted. Don't get distracted by what is. Put your faith in what can be. I prayed for the salvation of my parents for over 30 years. 30 years. I used to share with them four spiritual laws, a little yellow booklet, and I got to their house one day, I had a white shirt on, and, and I, had, uh, I had just gotten gas. This is back in the days where you got the little carbonless thing and you signed, when you did your credit card. Uh, you kids don't even know what I'm talking about. But they gave you this little yellow receipt, right? And, and I had stuck the yellow receipt in my pocket. You could kind of see the yellow through my shirt pocket because it was white. I walked into the house and my dad says, get out of here, get out of here, get out of here with that thing. What thing? That thing in your pocket. A gas receipt? <laughs> right? He just, he, he didn't want to hear it anymore. 30 years I prayed. God answered that prayer. Eight before my mother passed away. And eight years before my father lost his mind to dementia. Don't give up. Don't get distracted. Fight 
to focus. Say it with me. Fight to focus. It's worth it. Search the distractions for the fingerprints of God. If they're not there, ignore the distraction. If they are, go with it, whatever it may be, however crazy it may sound. Let faith conquer fear. Look past your traditions to the reality behind them and focus on that. Remember, it's all about the baby. Whatever you do, put Jesus in the center of it. He's in the center of the nativity. Put him in the center of your life. The Savior has come to you. He is Christ, the Lord. Let a little more Jesus into your Christmas and watch him light up your world. If you've never surrendered the leadership of your life to Jesus Christ, I'm glad you're here today. You're here on purpose. God brought you here for this message. You need to hear it and you need to respond to it. Talk to me before you leave. (coughs) I'll wear a mask. (coughs) But this is more important than whatever I got. We'll have coffee. We don't have to do it today. We can have coffee during the week. Sometimes the distraction is the main event. Let's close in prayer. Father, thanks. Thanks for your word. Thanks for your love that sent your son Jesus to this world to be born on a lowly manger to peasants, to grow up normal, like, like normal people, working father, mom taking care of the kids, goats and chickens running around the yard. But you were the son of God, the king of creation. And as an adult, you took all of my pain and suffering and sin and shame And you went to the cross and you died to pay the penalty so that I could be free. I could walk boldly and confidently in heaven because my sin has been paid for by your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for that. Thank you for this story, for Zechariah. Thank you for his acts before an empty room to remind me that there are many things I do before empty rooms in my life. Lord, let me all of the empty rooms with Jesus. Thank you for Christmas. Amen. Bless you. Nativity practice after that.